Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a special human design episode. Highly, highly requested. I'm so excited to have you here, Emma. Thank you for being here. And how are you doing today? It's morning for you. <laughs> it is indeed. It is morning. As I just said, I uh, just got back from the personal trainer, I quickly jumped through the shower and here I am. Yes. Um, yeah, life is sweet. I live in a little piece of heaven and um, yeah, everything's great. Thank you for mm. asking. I know last time we chatted on your podcast, I think you were talking about doing your ocean swims and I am just, I love Colorado, but I mean, we are very far from an ocean here. <laughs> so I'm pretty yeah. jealous about that. <laughs> Yeah, we're so lucky. And it's winter here in Australia. And, right. you know, we're still in the water, like the water's super warm. So and most days now um, are really sunny and they're like 22 degrees Celsius. So it's properly heaven on earth here. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Adding Australia back on my bucket list. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Put it on the list. Pandemic travel. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you. Uh, I know we had a fun time scheduling this too because of our time differences. So I'm so excited to be chatting with you again. And before we dive into all things human design that I want to talk about, if you could just share a little bit more about your background and how you became this expert in human design, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah, sure. So um, ultimately, I, when I went through my Saturn return at 28, um, I was diagnosed with depression and panic disorder, which was really the catalyst for a huge shift, change and evolution in my life. Um, you know, 20 years later, I'm now a certified um, behavioral coach, uh, master coach, uh, human design coach and teacher. Um, and ultimately, my entire journey has really been about um, taking my power back, but it's really been about, uh, becoming my own guru. You know, like I had this defining moment sitting in an office with a mental health expert. In fact, one of the leading mental health experts who said to me that I was going to have to learn to live with depression and panic disorder. And that just wasn't an option for me. Um, so this whole mission that I've kind of been on for the last 20 years has been to heal myself. Um, and then, that really sort of transferred or transmuted into supporting and helping others. Human design um, hilariously almost forced its way into my life. Like I came across it um, two times and put it back down because I'm a three, five. So there was so much unresourceful commentary about being a three, five. I was like, Oh, you know what? I already live this. I don't need you to be telling me this as well. Um, and I didn't find it at all supportive. And funnily enough, the first time, um, I learned about it, my husband brought it to me and he was a projector and I'm an MG. And I was like, I want to be a projector, you know, like everything that I was, I didn't want, and I wanted to be whatever someone else was. And you know, at the time, I didn't realize that that was literally a massive flashing light saying you are literally rejecting all of you um, and not stepping in. So as I went through my um, Uranus opposition, which is around 40, um, I literally said to the universe, OK, I've completely transformed my life, my my career. I've moved from advertising. I've created my own business. I've healed my relationship. I've had two kids. We live where we want to live, but I still don't feel fulfilled. Please help. Um, and that's when I made a promise that if you show me universe, then I'll just get on and do it. And within that time, human design turned up like over and over and over and over again. I was like, all right. And then everything with my human design journey has been very serendipitous from there. You know, my podcast it came as a download in the shower. I wrote it down in my journal. The next day, a mentor said, someone needs to do a podcast on this. And I was like, oh my goodness, like literally everything about human design, strategy and authority was showing up in my life. So I just followed the bouncing ball. And um, yeah, now the, the podcast, the human design podcast is massive. It has a life of its own. So is my business. And I'm so fulfilled. I love what I do every day. So Probably not a short answer, but I've tried to keep it as succinct as possible. No, that was that was a great background. And what you said about you're an MG, a manifesting generator, your husband's a projector, and you were like, oh, why can't I be like that? I'm a projector. And I find myself looking at the other energy types, the ones with defined sacrals who have their own power, the, the doing power, and I get really envious. So can you... Talk a little bit more about what you learned from that, about like how to embrace the 
energy type that you are? Yeah, I love that. This is a really important question um, because whenever we're experiencing this, it literally is us resisting and rejecting parts of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we're putting things into our shadow like I am a projector in your case or I am a manifesting generator Um, and and we don't want to assimilate it. We don't want to own it, accept it, love it, which means that we ultimately will be in resistance. We will be, you know, not experiencing flow. We will be living from the not self or our conditioning, from our fear, and really in this place of constantly feeling like we're stuck and disconnected. So one of the big things to understand is our human design, it is an experiment, you know, that fundamentally it's not another dogma. It's not here to tell you who you are. It's here to say this is how your energy is designed, but you have to bring it to life. You know, one of my favourite quotes um, from Ra Uruhu, who was the guy who originally channeled all the the knowledge, um, you know, he said that um, although this this role of Romeo in, in Romeo and Juliet, like it's the same lines every time, thousands of people have played Romeo and thousands of Romeos have existed because no one person is going to play that role the same way. Mm -hmm. So this is what our human design is. So the biggest step is just to go, okay, cool. I'm going to love and accept this and I'm going to start to experiment with it to discover what's true for me. And of course, you know, as soon as I um, shifted into that place, my entire world changed, you know, um, unfortunately human design can do what a lot of other, um, you know, in my experience, behavioral profiling tools and all of those things can do is can we can just move from one dogma to the other and people can get really stuck in, you know, um, well, I don't want to be that or that doesn't resonate for me. So the really important thing is that you just start experimenting, just give it a shot and see, um, you know, what works for you, what feels good, because when you're aligned to your design, it feels great. You know, no matter what you're doing, um, you know, it could just be, sitting on your front deck in the sun or it could be building an empire but it feels good and that's really what you want to follow that's always such a good guiding light right in any area of your life if it is feeling really good if you are getting that little spark of joy whether it is like a little ember or a raging fire listening to that almost never i mean i I would say never (laughs) never leads you astray Yeah. yeah And you also mentioned um, when you were talking that you're a three, five and profile your profile, those two numbers that everyone sees at the top of their chart. I feel like that's a really big piece of your chart, but it is not quite as easy, at least for me to find information on that. Um, Can you share a little bit about like, what is the profile? What are those numbers and where can people dig into that a little bit more? Yeah, that's a really good question. And our actual profile lines play a very significant role. Um, So I'll just go through them really, really simply. So whenever you see these two numbers, they're going to be, you know, like a three, five or a six, two or something like that. Um, And if the big number comes before the small number, then you've got a transpersonal profile, which means that your, um, your toolkit, your how you sort of do you, Uh, fulfill your purpose is going to be through the other. And then if you have a small number before a big number, then you've got a personal profile, which means you really are self-focused first. So um, my, the best example I can give is like for my depression, I read all the books, did all the exercises, went through everything for me, and then I could help others with it. But whereas my husband, who's a 6'2 profile, if he was to heal depression, not that he's ever experienced depression, but he would find someone else who had depression and help them heal. And through the process of helping them heal, he would heal himself. So that's how the, the, the profiles work initially. Now, they are our how, our toolkit. So these are the significant and predominant themes that, are, that we will play out um, that will also be intertwined with our energy, you know, whether it's our sun or our earth or whatever it is, but it's going to sort of be, um, you know, meshed together. And this is going back to the, the Romeo example. This is how we bring it to life. So there are certain themes, but how that profile line and that personality sun, let's say, theme come together is going to be really unique to you. So with finding out information on, again, on the the profile lines, one of the things that I see a lot is people, um, 
they make a lot of stuff up, you know, they don't actually keep it as simple. They're like, well, I feel it's like this and I feel it's like that. And one of the things I would say to you is just get the simple, the basics, you know, like you can check it out on my Instagram. Um, we have a lot of, a lot of free content, um, you know, even on the podcast, I talk about it and keep it as simple as possible and then run your experiment. So give, let me give you a, a quick example. So if you're a line one, if there's a line one in your profile, then you're the investigator. So you're going to be someone who wants details. You're going to go get really deep into things. You want to go going to know all the things. You're probably going to be quite introverted or intra-focused, you know, but you also probably experience a lot of um, inability to take action, you know, information gathering. Um, Sometimes you don't want to sort of put your head out there. So just experiment with those energies. What does that mean to you and how does that express? The line two, um, I call the line two the gifted child. It's the hermit. It's someone who wants to sort of be on their own. Um, But there's something really magical about the line two is that they have these natural gifts that they're actually not often aware of. And people will project onto them when their energy is ready to engage in that, you know, natural talent. Now, the shadow side of it is often the natural talent comes easily. So the line two doesn't value this thing, whatever it is, this this gift, this talent. So it's important for them to actually pay attention. And unlike the the line one, the line twos express everything out, everything outwardly. So they might be having, you know, tantrums or they might be be expressing emotionally or they might be expressing um, whatever it is, it's, it's external. So these are people that they need to actually practice getting in the shoes of the other person because they're just not as aware of the other. They're very in their own world. Then we have the line threes. Um, And if the line one is the book learner and the line two is the sort of natural learner, the line three is the experiment, experiential learner. So these are people like me that tend to fall down and get back up a lot. They experiment a lot. My favorite thing about being a line three is it gives me permission to be messy, like super messy. Like I just throw shit at a wall and see what sticks and see what works. And, you know, I'm really big on, and the line three is really big on taking a few things, pulling out the bits that don't work and putting something together to make something new. They're also natural leaders because of this fall down, get back up. Everyone's like, wow, you've walked in my shoes. You get me. Um, but one of the things the line three has to be very conscious of because it's so comfortable with messiness, um, making mistakes, um, you know, starting over, it can also tend to be like in relationships can tend to run away. Like, okay, I'm out. Um, you know, I can start this over, whatever. So it's just, you know, it's just being really conscious that you're here to make mistakes, but it's, it's, um, making sure that you're not running away before your authority says, Um, The line four is all about the community, all about the people. Uh, These are people who, they're called the opportunist, but this is basically an energy of people. These are people here on the planet to change the way others feel about others. You know, it's really about how people feel about each other. Um, Everything for a line four comes through their community. So if they're looking for jobs or if they're, um, you know, Uh, want to find a relationship, it's going to come through the people that they know. Uh, One of the things that they need to be super careful of is rejection. These are people that that fear rejection quite deeply um, because being a part of something, a, a group of people is really, really inherent in them and who they are here to be. Then we've got the line fives. The line fives are the leaders. The They can be a little bit superhero y. Um, they're very attractive. Like people know energetically that these people can solve their problems. The challenge with them and their projection field is that people project their wound onto the line five. So the line five can often cop quite a bit of unresourceful dysfunction um, sort of aimed in their direction. So it's super important for the line five not to take things personally. Um, Always, whenever that happens, just ask yourself with love and affection, like, where is that in me? Where do I accuse myself of that? Um, But a lot of the time, the actual projections in the context will be they couldn't feel very left of field because it's not at all about the line five. It's about the other person who energetically knows that they can solve the problem for them. Then we've got the line six, which is the role model. The role model is um, here to kind of watch all of the one, two, three, four, five, and then go, hmm, this is what I feel. I see all this. I experience all this. I'm, and this is what I feel. This is the wisdom that I'm going to bring to this. Um, 
And the role model is very much about authenticity. So oftentimes you hear a lot about the role model being a leader, but I, there's a real distinction here. The role model must lead themselves and be authentic. It's not about, you know, come on, people, come with me. It's like this is who I am. This is what I believe. Um, and when I am this unique authentic version of me that I'm super wise and yes people want to follow but it's all about that the journey for the line six um, and they just need to be super careful because in that journey they've got a three-phase journey which I kind of won't go into but um, they have to be really careful in their healing journey because they will project whatever's unhealed and whatever they perceive isn't good enough onto their partner um, and I mean I'm married to a line six and We've made it to soulmate, you know, we definitely soulmates. We're definitely in it for the for life. But we went through a really bumpy time because we got to, together at very young. Um, and he just projected all of his stuff onto me for years and years and years until he actually, you know, he's on the roof, processing the information, creating the wisdom, um, and then, you know, evolves and matures. But, yeah, so that's the profiles. And these are the themes of your how. So how are you going to do it? And the, the profile lines, getting to know your profile lines are really powerful because um, we actually play out the profile lines of all of our planets. It's just that our sun and our earth are the most prominent energy. So getting to know the profile lines is really, really powerful because it's going to help you um, get the nuances of your chart as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a lot of the the planets are kind of what you find along the edges of your chart. That's which right. I've had yep. that question too of just like, what are all these shapes? <laughs> like, yeah, that's where yep. a lot of the astrology comes in, right? Exactly. The personal planets and the ones down the bottom are the um, outer planets. So yeah, they all contribute. Mm -hmm. And I'm a five one, so. I related to a lot of what you said. That was a really good, really good condensed snapshot, I feel like. So yeah. thank you for that. Yeah. Oh, you're so welcome. Yeah. And another thing I wanted to ask you about, um, that's another big, I think, kind of first thing when people look at their charts is some of their centers are colored in and some are left white. So those are centers that are open or centers that are defined. Can you talk a little bit more about that and how that affects each of us? Yeah. Yeah, this is really important. I'm so grateful every day that I trained with the person that I trained with because she um, never taught type until the end. Like so right at the end of my certification program, we learnt type. Type can be really um, uh, pigeonholing. It can really get us stuck. Um, you know, I had a chart. I did an unpack yesterday for someone and they literally, they were a split definition and one part of them was manifesto because it was a manifesto channel. One part of them was a generator because it was a generator channel. And their third part was a projector because it was a projector channel. And these are the things that we don't learn. We just think, oh, we, we are this type, but we have all the energies within us. So when it comes to centers, it's super powerful to understand what's defined and what's undefined. And I talk a lot about this in all of my work because where we're defined fundamentally, this is where you're going to grow your trust in yourself, okay? Because where your definition is, it's like this is consistently and reliably me. This is who I feel I am. This is who people see I am. It's this consistent energy that keeps turning up. So you build the trust with yourself. You build the trust through self um, belief, you know, internal certainty. When we have an undefined or an open center, an undefined center will have a hanging gate. So something activated. An open center means there's nothing activated. Um, and when we have an, a, a white center or undefined or open, what we're actually happening in there is like this is a place that we need to build trust with the universe because it's going to be inconsistent. Sometimes it'll be there. Sometimes it won't be there. Sometimes we borrow it from someone as we walk into their transit, uh, sorry, into their aura. Sometimes the transits are on and they, they give us energy that's there, but it's going to switch on and off. So we have to build our trust in the universe because the universe is the one that's going to move us where we need to be so that we can borrow energy that we need to manifest whatever it is that we're working on manifesting into reality. So where you're white or undefined, this is where you, you just be aware there's going to be a level of uncertainty and it's really that place where you're like, okay, cool. I've got to trust the universe here. I love that. What's what's going on for you when you hear I'm that? I'm just laughing because 
um, you looked at my chart a while back and I'm sure you see a million, so you don't remember, but my, I'm a mental projector. So I have my Ajna, my head defined and everything else is open. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just laughing because I'm like, oh my God, I feel like I constantly put myself in situations where I am, I don't really like the word tested, but where it's kind of an opportunity for me to deepen into trust. I just feel like yeah. that comes up again and again and again for me. So what yeah. you're saying about like, I have all those open centers that make sense. Yeah. And what's really, you know, what's really interesting for you is like, you actually have to get really used to the, un the, the uncertainty that you feel in your body because your body's always giving you feedback. The wisdom still lies in your body. It just is a different way. So whenever you're with someone or in a specific environment, you just have to be really tuned into the body. Like what's the body saying? And it, it, you know, it might be saying, well, I'm amplifying something that feels really uncomfortable and I don't like it. Um, or the body might be saying, wow, I'm amplifying the feel something that feels really good right now. Um, and, you know, like even with the hobbies that you do, you'll feel like, yeah, this feels really good in my body because you're amplifying the energy around you. It's just that, you know, for a lot of people, <clears throat> like let's say someone who has a, a pure sacral authority, they just instantly know the same way in the moment what their decision is. And it just means for you, the the for the want of a better word, consistency you want to look for is just literally how do I feel in my body right now? Is this giving me something that feels resonant, good, expansive, or is this something that's making me feel stuck or, um, you know, pushing away? And, and that's where you're going to find your decisions from. And especially being a mental projector, just trusting that you can speak it out loud so you can hear um you know, what things feel like instead of trying to process it through the mind. Right. And Makes so what sense. you said about people with, with the sacral authority, just knowing is that, so they have a defined sacral, correct? Mm -hmm. but then is that when it says authority on their chart, it doesn't usually, does it usually say sacral always? No, not always because okay. there's a hierarchy to authority. Okay, so if you ever mm -hmm. define solar plexus, no matter your type, you've got emotional authority. The next mm -hmm. one in the hierarchy is sacral, then spleen, then ego, then um, G center, then um, the the head center or the ajna, uh, um, and then the you know no authority for the reflector. Mm -hmm. So it's really following whatever through that hierarchy is is the defined center that's going to give you what your authority is. So no, we can have um, so I have, uh, because I'm an MG, I have a defined uh, sacral, but I also have emotional authority. So my sacral can literally be going, yep, 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 do it, do it, do it, do it, do it. And my emotional authority is like, calm down. You know, I can feel something coming. I can feel it sort of percolating in my awareness. I can feel that it's even probably going to be a yes, but my solar plexus is like, not yet not yet and then all of a sudden I literally just get this feeling in my bo body of clarity like and I always call it the, the green light so it's go time now's the time so yeah and there are people that have you know they they could have the um the solar plexus the sacral and the spleen so they have so much going on in their body like really intensive guidance if you like but ultimately we always have to let our authority have the final say um, because like a, someone who has a defined spleen is going to have a lot of intuition talking to them, but they have to listen to their authority. If it's not the spleen, they have to listen to their authority because that's the thing that's got the, the greatest sense of what's best for you in this moment. And I feel like that's one of the things that I hear a lot from human design experts and coaches that I follow is like, if, if you're feeling not good, let's say you're probably not following your authority. So that's another mm -hmm. big piece, which we talked about a while ago on a prior episode on the podcast. But um, am I summarizing that right? Like that's kind of yeah. what you're using your authority well, for? Exactly. Well, here's the thing. The thing that it's almost one of my bugbears. So one of the things that I do is human design made simple. It's also part of my purpose. It's there in my chart. Um, I have the 43 in a place that we call vocation, um, which is all about simplicity, making the complicated simple. So I'm really big on making human design simple so that people can actually live it, can they can yeah. integrate it and use it. But one of the things that, um, and, you know, Ra Uruhu will say, 
on just about every single recording you ever listen to is all of this is pointless if you're not listening to your strategy and authority. If all the knowledge is useless if you don't live via your strategy on authority. So there is nothing more important. And ultimately, I believe that there's so many people out there overcomplicating human design because they're like, you've got to know your incarnation cross. You've got to understand your profile. You've got to do this. You've got to go deep into your, you know, your vocation. Check out the gene keys, like all yeah. over the place. And everybody always, like my experience, because I run masterminds and like uh, group coaching programs and memberships, ultimately everyone's like, tell me about my gates. And the biggest thing is like your gates don't matter if you don't listen to your strategy and authority. And one of the really fundamental things about the human design experiment is that you don't know, you don't know. And if you're using your mind to go, oh, well, my incarnation cross is the cross of planning. Therefore, this is who I am. Then you're never actually in alignment with your design. Your mind is thinking your design. So one of the things you just have to do, especially early on, is like just get strategy and authority down Um, and you can't screw it up. Like this is the other thing I want to say is like you cannot get this wrong. You've been making decisions your entire life, some of them good, some of them not so good. Now you've got a much better way to make decisions. So don't be afraid to to jump in and, and, you know, if you've got emotional authority, yep, it can be challenging because it's not, you know, even when we have clarity, I always joke it's like 86% clarity. It's never 100%. It's not like a defined cycle that will go, yep. And even defined cycles, I have that many people come to me and say, I can't feel my sacral. I don't know when it's saying yes and, and, and no. Or the splenic people like, how does my intuition talk to me? And I'm, well, it starts off at a whisper. So if you're ignoring it, it can be hard to hear. So There are all these processes, but at the end of the day, if you literally just take imperfect action, you know, even for me, I've been doing my experiment for a number of years now. And, um, you know, two weeks ago, I um, did something in my business, didn't get the result I wanted. I was like, damn it, I need to, you know, uh, bridge this gap. I need to plug this gap. I go hunting for what I want. I buy this program knowing that my emotional authority is like, "Mm -mm, mm-mm, mm-mm don't do it. Don't do it. So I I literally, I force myself down this road. I end up buying a program that actually isn't, you know, on at the moment, get my money back, all of this frustration over a four day period. And then I, um, on the fifth day, I meet this person. I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I was looking for. There's the gap. So what I want you to understand is like, my emotional authority was like, you don't have to do anything. Just sit, just go through this process. Like do the learning. You've identified the gap. Now let the universe bring you something external to respond to. That's easy, but I didn't. I let the mind sort of push and force and go down that road. And it was, you know, it was fine. It all worked out fine, but I didn't need all of that because I should have just listened and got to the point and gone, oh, hey, nice to meet you. You're exactly who I'm looking for. So practicing that like don't be afraid to get it wrong just (coughs) just do the experiment yeah gosh I'm just letting that sink in because I really 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 like what you just said and it feels like to me human design can also then be a tool to come back to your body and to rebuild that trust like yes in the universe and like me, all areas of my life, (laughs) but also just in those signals from your body and, and learning how to listen again. And I like how you brought up, you know, people come to you and say, I don't know if I can hear that anymore. I certainly hear that from people a lot. Like I actually had someone tell me once, I don't think my gut and my brain communicate at all anymore. I'm like, yeah, that's actually like a a lot of people feel that way. Like you're not the only one. So are there specific ways that you or other people have used human design to turn up the volume on those cues from your body specifically? That's a really great question. I love that. Um, And I would say that the short answer is yes, you know, because whenever um, I'm teaching human design or, you know, working with someone with their human design, that is the thing. Like a lot of my students are like, I know, I know, get back into my body. Um, so we do, you know, like we get to know those consistent energies within us. You know, if you've got a defined sacral, let's say it's all about excitement, joy, but feeling lit up. 
And oftentimes people will be like, well, nothing lights me up. And and that in itself is an indicator because they're probably in some sort of, you know, functional burnout or, um, you know, like he's like you, you use the example, like just completely disconnected, like nothing's talking to anything anymore because it's like, well, you weren't listening. So we stopped talking to you. So oftentimes it really is about getting back into the body, doing things that you love and then just noticing how it feels. Um, you know, I'm always teaching people to practice body scanning um, because they need to know how it feels to be themselves in their own aura with no one else. And then how it feels when someone else enters their aura, because what happens is that before we know to do this, we will, um, you know, be wandering around or having conversations and all of a sudden we feel a certain way. And then we look inward and say, well, I shouldn't think that, or I shouldn't feel that, or why do I feel that? Or, um, God, I shouldn't be like that because blah, 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 and build all these stories that just aren't true. And what's more, it it's, may not even be your energy, you know. I remember this story from a mental projector um, on my mastermind who we were talking about this and she had that same thing, like that real realisation, like, oh, my goodness, you mean all of these things I feel are probably not mine? I'm like, probably not yours. Um, And the example that was really powerful for her and how she sort of put this into action is she was playing tennis with friends and um, she had done a line call and it was, you know, really close, but she felt really comfortable with it, you know, down her end. She's sweet. Yep, that's out, whatever. And as she was changing um, ends, she passed her friend and all of a sudden she felt frustration and anger and all of these emotions and she at first was like yeah i'm frustrated at you because you don't believe my line call and da 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 and then she was like oh, hang on a second that's how it works i walked past him i felt his energy i identified saying like i'm annoyed at him but in that moment she was like actually i'm not annoyed at anything that's your energy you can keep it i'm going to keep walking and that it can be as simple as that when we can't become really, really aware that when we feel something, we make it mean something. So if we choose to be like, well, it's probably not mine anyway, um, we can let it go and let that energy just, just you know, roll off us or move through us or whatever it is. I've even taught people to, you know, sort of catch emotional energy, roll it in a ball and send it back to where it came from. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just super powerful to become very, very aware of how other people's energy influences your, how you feel in your aura. Mm -hmm. I have definitely noticed that. And that is one of those, it's, it's a skill really. It is not something like if you're listening to that and you're like, I can't sense people's energies. What are you guys talking about? It is a skill. It is something that we have been along with any like spiritual gifts, like basically suppressed over the last hundreds of years. And it Mm. takes practice to turn it back on. So yes, I love that you said body scans, um, time alone in any regard, but for me, like alone in nature is, wow, it's, it's cleansing on an energetic level. Like, especially because I have so many open centers and I feel like very, it's easy for me to take on things from other people or other places. So like my husband was just out of town for like four days and usually we're always together. And before he left, he was crazy packing and stuff. And I felt like I don't really drink that much caffeine anymore. And I felt like I was jumping out of my skin. And I was like, what is happening to me today? Like, why do I feel so crazy? And then I look at him running around the house, like packing stuff. And I'm like, oh, (laughs) it's because Archie's crazy today. (laughs) Like, it doesn't have to do with me. And I just kind of like closed the door to my office and like took a little time for myself. And I felt way better. And that wasn't quote unquote negative energy. It's just, um, it's just coming back to like your center. And like, we've been talking about coming back to your body and practicing that awareness again and again and again, practicing that inner dialogue again and again and again. Yeah. I love that. And there's two things I want to add to that. Um, number one, um, I'll come back to negative energy just so I don't forget negative energy. But the the first thing when, when it comes to like intuition um, and all of these subtle energies, you're absolutely right. It's a skill. It's a muscle that we build. But oftentimes we have no idea that we're even doing it. So let me give you an example. One thing I've said over and over, I don't know how many times in my lifetime, up until two years ago was, 
Like everything in my chart, everything in my astrology, everything in all of the spiritual things says that I'm this really intuitive human, but I don't see visions and I don't hear things. I'm not intuitive. Like I don't, blah, 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 blah. like I had all of these things. I'm like, I really want to feel that. I want to access that. And I was so sure, like I was so convinced that I don't have it, don't do it, can't access it. Then I sign up to do a program with my dear friend, Jess Babaco. Um, and to start the program, she gets you to do a cold read. So she gives you a person's name. That's it. And then she just guides you into a meditation and says, just read this person. It blew my mind because I saw the person's face. I picked all these problems that were going on. I gave her solutions. I knew where she lived, like um, all of this massive advice, secrets. She, she literally reached out and said, no one has read me this well ever. And, you know, that was like, oh, you mean all that stuff that goes on inside of me is real? And that was like a game changer for me because I went on to do this program and like I saw people's dead husbands and had conversations, like many dead husbands. Um, I had conversations about business, like uh, one guy in particular, like he had a massive pivot in his business. He just reached out to me the other week, like you have no idea how much that reading impacted me, blah, 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 blah. So one of the things I'll say is like, and my kinesiologist said this to me 20 years ago when I sort of first went to see her, she was like, Emma, what if that was, what if those things that you see, feel, know, um, what if they were real? Just pretend, imagine that, that they were real. And if I'd listened to her back then, because she was right, um, you know, a lot of this journey to find my intuition, I, I wouldn't have even gone there because, you know, one of the things I know now today is I'm hugely intuitive. Um, you know, like I can walk down the street and I walk past someone and I'm like, oh, God, you know, I'm going to send you love for that because I know what's going on in their world. And this is one of the things as well that I want to say about human design is like where our centers are undefined, we are taking in the world, amplifying it and reflecting it back. And this is where we're em empaths. Um, and I'm emotionally defined, but I would also consider myself an emotional empath. It's just that I feel it in a different way than other people. Um, so yeah, number one, it's a skill, but you have to actually believe that it's already happening. In most cases, it's already happening. The other thing I want to come back to that you said that was really powerful was about your husband, Archie, about his energy. And you said, like, it wasn't bad energy. This is something as well. And someone asked me just the other day, how do I protect my energy? Right. And I think that this is one of the things that, um, again, people really don't do themselves a surface service because they spend all this time focusing on, I need to protect my energy. I need to protect my energy. And the presupposition, you're presupposing when you have to protect your energy that you need to protect it from something bad, right? So you're actually saying there's all this bad energy and it's going to get attached to me and I'm really scared about that. Mm -hmm. So you're living in fear. You're not in alignment. So one of the big things for me, and I, I'm not big on this, and I've literally been told, you know, by my kinesiologist, she's like, you need to make sure you cleanse your energy and da, da, da. And I'm like, well, I can't do all that ceremony stuff because by the time I'm finished in my day, I'm done. So I have a shower. It's as simple as that. Or I go for a swim um, and that cleanses my energy. And I always set the space in the beginning. I'm always like for my highest and truest good only or whatever it is. But one of the things human design really teaches us is we have to stop being afraid of other people's energy. The thing that is getting in your way is that you're identifying with other people's energy. You're making it your own and it's not your own. Just like you said, like Archie's running around. You're like, How, why do I feel this way? Oh, hang on a second. I don't feel this way. I'm just in his energy. So there's nothing to be done. I don't need to do anything about it. I can literally just go into my office and move out of his aura and I'm good and I'm sweet. Because what we need to be more focused on is just letting go, letting go of other people's energy, not identifying with it, not, you know, like one of the, the, the last people in my life that I can get affected by is my mum, you know, and I'm constantly reminding myself like that, just let her be her. She's okay. You don't have to take this stuff on. So that's a really big thing that, that I want people to know, like stop being so attached to protecting your energy, set the space, you know, like today is going to be the best day ever. And I'm only going to be, um, you know, I'm only going to be in the, 
the highest and best energy for me or whatever it is, like set that up, but stop focusing on protecting yourself from something because the presupposition is telling your unconscious mind that there's something bad and to be afraid. And that is not a good way to be operating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for highlighting that because I, I don't even love using good or bad or, you know, what, what is negative or even just if it's something that feels uncomfortable, right? We might call it yeah. bad, but just like you said, it can be that easy to, to release it. We don't have to hang on to it, but it does take that continued practice of awareness and coming back yeah. to yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And this makes me think of, you know, shifting gears into like looking at this from a wellness lens, how much this knowledge, this practice of self-awareness of your energy and these bits and pieces we've talked about with human design could affect building new habits or breaking old habits. Yeah. Would you agree with that, that it kind of can play that role into how how much you either feel stuck in a habit pattern you really want to break? Yeah. Or you're like, why can't I build this new habit? <laughs> yeah, I love that. Um, and short answer is yes. One of the things that I love because I'm, you know, a master coach, behavioral coach, I've done so much work around mindset, um, you know, I understand how the brain works, I understand how, you know, the heart brain coherence works, I understand the heart brain, like you name it, I've studied it. Um, and one of the things for, through my experience, because I'm an emotional authority, line three and an MG, so there's a lot of inconsistency, a lot of up and down for me. Um you know, one of the things I would notice is that my friends would have massive shifts with an NLP process and my shift would take a few goes or whatever it is. So how does human design play into it? Sometimes if you've got an emotional authority, healing's going to be a little bit more inconsistent and it's going to take a little bit longer because it's almost like you need to heal it in the high, the, the, the center and the low. Um, for someone who doesn't have that, they'll tend to clear things a little bit more quickly. But the really cool thing, this is the thing that I love, is that when we know our design and we can just, because we live in a quantum reality, we just need to look at it. Like we don't have to get it or do it. None of that. We just have to look at, look at it. And we can be curious about it. Like, oh, what does that mean? Or what does that feel like? Or, you know, read things about particular parts of our gates and just sit with it. Because what can happen is, when you take the pressure off to do it, get it right, integrate it and just play with it, it's already integrating, okay? As soon as you see it, it's already integrating. Um, but what I've seen and experienced myself is that you go through parts of your, your design and you'll, like some of my gates, I didn't even know were there for three years. Do you know what I mean? And then finally I'm like, oh, God, look at that. I do have that gate. That, I didn't know that. And it was just because I wasn't ready to go through the process or learn that lesson or whatever it was. But what's really cool with your design is that sometimes you can read a part of it or learn a part of it and be like, oh, my God, I have literally been trying to fix this in me my entire life. So you just drop it. And overnight, like you literally change your behavior because all of a sudden you're putting down something that you thought was wrong with you is actually a superpower of yours and you can move on like so freely. So often when we we really understand and learn our design, we, we know we're learning our design when we're not learning anything new about ourselves. We're just going, oh, wow, I've been punishing myself for being me. So I can just put all this other stuff down. Like all I have to do is be me. Um, and I think this is the power of human design. And like when it comes to wellness, I think it's really interesting because we can look at our definition. And if, for me, for example, like um, the two areas that I'm working on healing at the moment is the sacral like and like the womb and the throat. And I also have the 3420, which is a channel that goes from the sacral to the throat. And my mind is like, oh, you're working too much and talking too much. And as I've gone down this, this journey and this healing, it's like, oh, no, actually, I come from a long line of women shouldn't speak. So here's my soul going, yeah, I'm here to speak. I'm here to be heard. And it's like pumped and excited, but there's a part of my body that's like, oh no, but it's not safe to speak. So it's about really getting into that experiment. Um, and the mind's going to have an opinion about your design, but you just have to be there with it and discover what's true for you. Um, 
you know, one of the big things for me is I also had a belief system is if you work too hard, you get sick, but I'm an MG, I'm designed to work. So what would happen is that I'd be working really hard. I'd get afraid that I was going to get sick. So I'd wind it back as soon as I wound it back and I was, there wasn't much on, I'd get sick. So it's like that whole, oh my goodness, no, I'm actually designed to be working and consistently working and lit up by it. And my my body will tell me when not to work. And this is a big thing. Like we can also do functional burnout, um, anyone with a defined sacral. Whereas for you, when you go into burnout, you know, like you're, you're flat out, you know, for manifestors, projectors and reflectors. But MGs and generators, we can almost not know that we're doing it. Um, we just literally lose any passion or lust for life um, and everything is just like Groundhog Day. So that's a time that we need to reconnect. But I think from a wellness point of view, your design is really going to give you some massive indicators um, of, you know, where to look, you know, and how to heal. Yeah, and it's so uh, just this is why I love this kind of tool, why I love spiritual practices anything that helps you reconnect the mind and body, because everything that you said made me think of like self-compassion, self-love, forgiveness to self and to others, listening to your heart or listening to your gut, you know, however you want to think about it. And isn't that just like the key to peace and to just living your life with more joy and with more freedom? So yeah. mm. Oh, what a good, what a good place to end. Thank you for that. Thank you for all of your knowledge today. And if people want to check out your podcast, which I was on recently, go listen to that one or uh, your Instagram, like where's the best place to find you and learn more. So the best place to find me is either the human design podcast, or you can find me on Instagram, which is the, the human design coach, or just search Emma Dunwoody and you'll find me. Um, that's probably the best place or the, the website, which is Emma Um, and there's, you know, a load of, a load more content and information on all three of those, those places. I feel like I, um, in fact, there, I, I'm not sure if I said it on our podcast, but I think I've definitely almost pissed off some of the old school human design people because I've given, you know, my experiment, I've just shared my experiment as I've gone yeah. and I've given a lot of information because I really feel like, um, you know, human design can change the world. And, and one of my missions is that my, when, when I finally have grandchildren, that they'll get to go to school with their human design and they'll be taught the way they're designed to be taught. So yeah, the more people we can convert, the, the more people, um, you know, the, the better we're going to support this world. Yeah. Ah, oh, amazing. Well, everyone go check out that content. And if you enjoyed this episode, if you learned something new, share it to your story, tag Emma and I, and leave a review while you're at it. And thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Bye.